Hi, and welcome back. I'm so happy to be back with you guys on our weekly meeting here. So today we are going to be talking about PCOS and hypothyroidism. So that's polycystic ovarian syndrome as it relates to hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. And the reason why I'm going to say this is a little bit of a controversial topic is because some studies are actually titled subclinical hypothyroidism is not a risk factor for polycystic ovarian syndrome in obese women of reproductive age, but other studies will show a distinct correlation. So I don't need a study to tell you that there is a correlation between PCOS and hypothyroidism. So many of you know, I've, I've been very open about my whole entire health journey with you. Many of you know that I have PCOS as well. And in my practice, I've been doing this a long time, people, in my practice, I see a very strong correlation in my women patients with PCOS and hypo and Hashimoto's. We're going to dive in today and actually show you and go through some studies of how even autoimmune, so Hashimoto's itself is very much correlated with PCOS. So let's dive in, shall we? And as always, ask me questions. If you have them, we'll go over them at the end because I know many of you are struggling with both conditions. And some of you might not even know that you have PCOS because the diagnostic parameters have actually changed in recent years. So it used to be that you actually had to have cysts on your ovaries, hence the polycystic ovarian syndrome name. But now that's, they're ruling it out. They're saying you don't even have to have cysts on your ovaries to be diagnosed with PICO. So that's what they're kind of thinking about a different name for that, which would make sense. As long as you have two out of three criteria. So one of the criteria is elevated, uh, elevated testosterone levels and irregular periods. So kind of in the, in the hormone area, we normally see, normally we see high estrogen, high testosterone, low progesterone, and cycles that are just all over the place. They could be anovulatory. You can miss months and months. You could have heavy cycles. You could have two in a month. Basically, your cycles are just all over the place with PCOS. And then we also see that insulin resistant component. And this is where hypothyroidism and PCOS overlap so very much. You've heard me talk about insulin resistance and hypothyroidism being very tightly correlated. We see it a ton together. We see those two go together. And then that gives you that double whammy to your metabolism and just makes it virtually impossible to lose weight. So let's go through all of the different symptoms of PCOS and hypo, and let's go through the actual like, biological mechanisms and why they are tied together. Now, the studies that I found, I found more studies that correlate the two than don't. So I look through the medical literature, do a PubMed search, go on Google Scholar, and you're going to find these studies. And you might find the one that says that subclinical hypo is not a risk factor for PCOS, but then you'll find ones that really do tie it together and break it down and explain why? Now, there's a lot of unknowns. There's still a lot of unknowns out there with the actual um, causative factors of both diseases. Now, of course, we know with Hashimoto's, that's autoimmune. We know that. But when we're talking about hypothyroidism, it could be caused from overexercising, stress, radiation, certain medications, um, uh, nutrient deficiencies, selenium deficiencies, and there's a lot that causes non-Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So we're still kind of really piecing all that together. And the same with PCOS. We don't really know what that causative factor is. There's a little bit of a hereditary component, but we don't know that underlying cause. So really that's where we have to break this down. Did you know that actually thyroid disorders and PCOS are the two most common endocrine disorders in the general population. Now, of course, I found this in the study. I knew that about hypo, right? I mean, I see that in, in my practice every day with all of you, with my patients. I see many patients coming with undiagnosed hypothyroidism, being told they are quote unquote normal when they are not. And when we do the full thyroid panel that has to be done, beyond TSH, we can't diagnose hypo with TSH alone. When we do that full panel, we see, oh, look here, 
here in fact is hypothyroidism presenting itself with low free T3. Here's high reverse T3 causing a huge issue. Oh, look, here are some antibodies that have never, ever, ever been tested. Guess what? You have Hashimoto's, but yeah, we know your TSH didn't reflect it for years, but you probably had it for decades. So there's a lot of misdiagnosed, undiagnosed hypo kind of just going on in the world. Um, so I knew that that was one of the top, but I did not know that PCOS was one of the two most common endocrine disorders in the general population. So that was kind of new to me. That was kind of interesting, actually. So like I said, when we're talking about PCOS, PCOS is an important cause of both menstrual irregularity and androgen excess in women. So that's that high testosterone that we're talking about can also be high DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which will cause hair loss. Does that sound familiar with hypo? That's one of the common symptoms that we struggle with with hypo too. So we're going to see a lot of symptoms overlapping here. PCOS can be readily diagnosed when women present with the classic features of hertuism. So facial hair, acne, it's normally the hormonal acne around the chin, acne on the chest and the back, signs of that high testosterone level irregular menstrual cycles, like we talked about, and polycystic ovarian morphology on transvaginal ultrasound. So this is where we check to see if there are indeed cysts on the ovaries. And like I said, you know, sometimes we'll do that ultrasound, there'll be the string of pearls, you know, that we see those little cysts on the ovaries. Sometimes women will actually feel the cysts on their ovaries. They're very teeny tiny. Sometimes that they will rupture, you'll get a sharp pain. Some women feel that, others don't. And they still have what we are call calling PCOS, even without the actual cyst being found on their ovaries with the ultrasound. So there's been a lot of controversy about specific diagnostic criteria. Like we said, we're now saying two out of three, two out of three, and we have to factor in insulin resistance in there. So when we have two out of three diagnostic criteria, we say PCOS. That's where you get the term PCOS. That's where you get the diagnosis PCOS. <laughs> So then, like we talked about earlier, and many of you know this, but I'm just going to glaze over this just for anybody listening that is not quite clear. Hypothyroidism is a problem with your thyroid gland. Hashimoto's is a problem with your immune system where your soldiers are attacking your thyroid. So you got these little soldiers. You guys have heard me talk about this before. They're super confused. They go out. They beat up your thyroid gland. They basically break it down to nothing. And this obviously decreases the amount of thyroid hormone that your gland can produce. If you're getting beat up on a daily basis, you're not going to work very efficiently. You're not going to be at your best. So poor thyroid getting beat up by these soldiers daily basis, not producing the proper amounts of T4 and T3 thyroid hormone. Same thing with hypothyroidism, but that's an actual problem with a thyroid gland. Causes, like we talked about earlier, over-exercising, certain medications, chemotherapy, radiation, um, excess stress, on and on and on, nutritional, nutrient deficiencies, and whatnot. So all of that can actually cause your thyroid, ga thyroid gland to downregulate and basically say like, help, I'm just not working very well. Whereas Hashimoto's is the immune system. So it's the immune system problem. The association of PCOS and autoimmune thyroid disease is really being recognized more and more in the literature. And that's what I find fascinating. That's what I really want to dive into today, as well as the treatments for this, because I know many of you, if you are listening right now and you're suffering with PCOS, you've been given birth control as a Band-Aid. Uh, you may have been given some metformin too, but not always actually. And I don't have a big problem with metformin. I do have a problem with birth control just being slapped on as a Band-Aid instead of getting to the root cause. So we now know if a woman presents with these symptoms, the first thing we check is the thyroid because there could be an underlying autoimmune component because it's closely tied in. There could be just hypothyroidism in general that is making the, the patient present with all these symptoms. We can't yet call it PCOS because so many of the symptoms overlap. Think about it, hair loss, obesity, um, inability to sleep, irregular periods, weight gain, skin problems, acne, all of these sounds so, so familiar, don't they? So the thyroid being the master gland, 
master gland is going to have a trickle down effect onto the sex hormones. So it can easily dysregulate and cause your progesterone to plummet. It can cause um, estrogen dominance, which is a huge issue. Then estrogen dominance is going to cause weight gain and water retention. It can cause testosterone levels to increase beyond what they are, what they should be in a woman. So if we like you around like 40, 60, 70, you can easily bump up to 150 as long as you're not taking any exogenous testosterone. This is happening naturally because your thyroid gland is messed up. Now the th hypothyroidism of the Hashimoto's can trickle down and actually cause this dysregulation and cause what we will find today, a morphology of the ovaries causing them to thicken and actually causing the cyst. So it's almost like a, like a, a balance, like a feedback loop. So here we have this association with PCOS and autoimmune thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, and that's being increasingly recognized. So one study states that while the causality of this association is still uncertain, the two conditions share a bi-directional relationship. That's what I just said. It's just, it's feedback. It's back and forth, back and forth. So adiposity, weight gain, increased insulin resistance, high leptin. That's another shareable component. We see leptin resistance. And I've talked to you all about leptin and how it needs to be tested because we see an increase in leptin resistance with insulin resistance and with thyroid conditions. So high leptin evidence of deranged autoimmunity, all of which are present in both disease states seem to play a complex role in connecting these two disorders. We can see the overlap right away. There's huge amounts of overlap. And this is where some patients go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Maybe you've gotten the diagnosis of PCOS, but nobody checked your thyroid. Nobody checked it thoroughly. Nobody did all of the tests that I tell you to get done. The TSH, the free T3, the free T4, the reverse T3, the thyroid antibodies. And if you need those, and if you need the optimal lab values, because we want you optimal, not just normal. If you need those, you can go to, you know what, we'll put it in the show notes. You can grab a free downloadable guide, the lab and symptom checklist. And in there, we'll have all of the tests that you need, the optimal lab values. And by the way, it'll have some symptoms that maybe you start checking off and you go, oh my gosh, that's me. So it's really kind of interesting. Okay. So Although, the, like we said in the beginning, the cause and the exacerbation that what drives hypothyroidism and PCOS, they're totally different. So the base cause and what drives the two are totally different. These two entities have many features in common. So an increase in ovarian volume and cystic changes in ovaries have been reported in primary hypothyroidism. So when we go, we set the Hashimoto's aside, primary hypothyroidism. We see an increase in ovarian volume and cystic changes in the ovaries. This is tied to primary hypothyroidism. In the other direction, it's increasingly realized that thyroid disorders are more common in women with PCOS as compared to the normal population. So where we see one, we see others. Now, my story was I was diagnosed. Well, you, you all know I was misdiagnosed six times, right? So by the time I was finally diagnosed by doctor number seven, who put me on T4, and then functional medicine doctor, my mentor and savior, number eight, finally switched me over. I was diagnosed with hypo first. And then it wasn't until about a year-ish, maybe year, year and a half later, that I went back to my functional medicine practitioner, my mentor, my savior. And I said, you know what? I'm getting, I'm getting this acne now. You know, all, I can't, I feel like a prepubescent girl. I don't know. I was like in my 20s. I felt like I was 12. Um, I had, I was missing periods, but that was almost like a norm to me. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to go two months. I'm not going to worry about it. But when you put it all together, and I just figured it was tied to the hypo and I was still balancing out and I was still getting optimized, but I had the acne, I had the missed periods, and now I was gaining weight. And I was like, hold up. You know, we finally got me optimized. We got me on T4 and T3. I was feeling good. I lost that weight that I had put on while going through that perfect period of being misdiagnosed while working out and on a strict diet. You guys know my story there. If you don't, you'll hear it at some point if you keep listening to me. 
And the weight started coming back on. So of course you go, all right, wait a minute. Nothing else has changed here. Do you know, I walked into my functional medicine practitioner's office, told him this. He looks at me and goes, oh yeah, you have Picos. I mean, we could do an ultrasound to confirm it if you want, but um, you have Picos. I was like, okay. <laughs> so therein is the insulin resistant piece that we never really addressed in the beginning. We were addressing my thyroid and things have come so far in 25 years, 24 years, that I certainly don't put that on him for not checking, but I always check insulin levels with my patients now. We have to check insulin, we have to check A1C, we gotta check your glucose because insulin resistance and hypo go hand in hand, they're so tightly woven together. So the insulin resistant component of PCOS was on its rise and causing me to gain weight. And as you know, you have to treat thyroid and insulin same time. You can't treat one without the other. We can optimize your thyroid and sometimes insulin will come into beautiful alignment. Other times we have to treat both. So God bless the soul. We did not do birth control. We did do metformin, however, because berberine was not a thing back then. So we did metformin and that actually helped tremendously because when you lower the insulin, you end up kind of sort of affecting the testosterone level too, which helped take care of the acne. Now we also use something called Vitex Chaseberry or Agnes Cassis. And this is wonderful as well as this is a progesterone balancer. So it's not like taking a progesterone pill that's going to raise your progesterone high, possibly too high if you're not that low. I mean, in my 20s, we didn't want to be hitting me with progesterone levels of someone moving into perimenopause and menopause. So we used Agnes Castus and this just balanced the progesterone, which then helped to bring down the testosterone in addition to bringing down the insulin. And then we also use DIM to pull out the bad estrogen because I was estrogen dominant. Now we know that estrogen can interfere with T4 to T3 conversion. We don't want that. At the time I was on armor thyroid still, I was not T3 only yet. So I did not want that high estrogen level. And it probably was playing a role in interfering with the conversion of T4 to T3, hence the weight gain, hence the, the side effects, hence all my symptoms, right? So we can see how these are, they're layering, they're crossing over each other. They look a lot alike, don't they? So that's my story. That's how I was diagnosed. Literally, my functional medicine practitioner looked at me, listened to my symptoms, go figure. That's what we should be doing, right? That's what all docs should be doing. Listen to the person, treat him like a real person. And then he just nailed it. Now we did confirm it with an ultrasound, but I was well on my way to treatment anyways. And this is a big factor in fertility. Now I never had kids, so it wasn't a big deal to me, but for many women, it is a huge deal because PCOS and a non-optimized thyroid will make you infertile. And you certainly don't want to be going and getting pregnant without having your thyroid optimized. Then you're set up for autism and birth defects. So we don't want that. But if you have untreated hypothyroidism and you're walking around with PCOS, you might not get pregnant anyways. So infertility is a huge, huge side effect, huge symptom of, of PCOS because of the irregular menses, the ir irregular cycle. So what we do know is in the presence of hypothyroidism, ovarian morphology becomes polycystic. So your ovaries actually are more prone to develop cysts when you are hypo. Okay. So I don't know in my case, which came first, the chicken or the egg. I know how I was diagnosed. I don't know if the PCOS was there before. My guess is, is that it was hypothyroidism first. And then as we see in the studies, or ovarian morphology becomes more polycystic. So I started developing the cysts on my ovaries and then it started affecting the hormone levels. So what we see with this is a rise in thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, in primary hypothyroidism, leads to an increased prolactin and an increased TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. So the prolactin contributes to the polycystic ovaries by inhibiting ovulation as a result of the change in the ratio of FSH and LH and then you have an increased DHT. So we have luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. Those are being affected by the prolactin. We're seeing an increase in TSH. So we have the presence of hypothyroidism, 
cysts become, or ovaries become cystic. Now we have a rise in TSH. That's a problem. And then we have an imbalance in FSH, LH, and a rise in DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone. Think hair loss, hair loss, the bad testosterone. So, and then obvious, the most obvious connection is increased BMI, insulin resistance. That's common to both conditions like we talked about. So we see insulin resistance without PCOS tied to hypo. We definitely see insulin resistance tied to PCOS, hands down. So obesity is associated with an increase in pro-inflammatory markers and an increase in insulin resistance. So obesity of in and of itself, just being obese alone is going to increase those pro-inflammatory markers and it's going to increase insulin resistance. So we're going to get to this whole big cycle in a second. Hang with me. Stay there. So then we have a, with obesity, stay with me, thyroid people, with obesity and pro-inflammatory markers, increased insulin resistance leads to decreased diiodinase 2 activity at the pituitary level, resulting in T3 deficiency and an increase in TSH levels. Okay, I know that was a lot to take in. So we're going to do this little chart. We have increased adipose tissue, increased fat, leads to increased pro-inflammatory markers, leads to increased insulin resistance, which can actually feed back to making you fatter. Increased insulin resistance leads to decreased D2 activity in the pituitary, which leads to increased TSH, making you more hypo, leading to more fat, leading to increased inflammatory markers, leading then to insulin resistance, which causes more D2, act decreased D2 activity in the pituitary, pushing up that TSH even more, leading to more weight gain. And then we just go in a big circle. So hopefully you follow that. It's just one big circle, one big vicious, vicious cycle. And that's why we see all of this connected. We see PICOs connected with hypothyroidism because it just feeds upon itself. And even the, the individual components, the individual symptoms like insulin resistance alone is so tightly tied to the reduction in D2 activity in the pituitary increased TSH. So it's just feeding, it's feeding on itself. It's feeding on itself. Leptin we've talked about, increased leptin and obesity has been proposed to act directly on the hypothalamus resulting in increased TRH secretion thus then eventually increase TSH levels. So when we have leptin resistance, you know, you have the thyroid at the top as the master, it can cause insulin, it can cause leptin resistance, but we can also see leptin resistance causing the increase in TSH levels. We still don't know, and, and, and the studies that I looked at, the one thing that we just can't find is the increased incidence of like, why is there an increased incidence of Hashimoto? So thyroid autoimmunity in patients with PCOS. But we see it. We see it hands down. Thyroid autoimmunity is increased in patients with PCOS. So females with PCOS have higher thyroid antibody levels. We know this. We just don't know the exact explanation. There's been some hypotheses. There's been some guesses. Um, mainly tied back to those pro-inflammatory markers, decreasing the function of the immune system, tying in T cells and B cells, and we're not going to get that down in the weeds today. But just so you know, basically women with PCOS are more predisposed to autoimmune diseases. And that question was proposed in one study, and the answer was yes. There seems to be some theoretical basis for this statement. PCOS is known to be hyperestrogenic state. So that's why I said earlier, we, we see that estrogen dominance come on. So we see the high testosterone, low progesterone, high estrogen, that estrogen dominant state. It's like a, like a three-way seesaw, right? One goes up, one goes down. And then that hyperestrogenism, high estrogen, has been, has been proposed as one explanation for the occurrence of increased autoimmune diseases in females when compared to males. So we see that that high estrogen is affecting the autoimmune component, affecting the immune system. We're also seeing, like I said earlier, these 
drivers of pro-inflammatory markers, which also start to affect the immune system and kind of flip that switch. So remember with all autoimmunity, with Hashimoto's, there has to be that trigger. With all autoimmunity, there's that trigger. Sometimes it's pregnancy. We'll think about in pregnancy, your hormone levels are imbalanced. Sometimes it's just stress with those high cortisol levels. That will flip that switch. Um, other things, leaky gut, nutrient deficiencies. There are many things that will turn on that switch of autoimmunity. But one of them, a big one, is high estrogen levels. So that can occur from, of course, PCOS. It can occur from you just microwaving your food in plastic too much, diffusing lavender oil every day, rubbing lavender body wash on you or body lotion on you, sprinkling lavender on your pillow, drinking out of a BPA-free plastic water bottle that's actually made with BPF, just that alone. And then throw on some parabens and polyparaben and the parabens in your face cream and body wash and you're in a hyperestrogenic state. You're, you're estrogen dominant now because you have so many xenoestrogens. Throw in a soy-based protein shake, then you're really good to go. And by the way, eat some tofu and edamame while you're at it because somebody told you it was healthy. That alone is going to put you in an estrogen dominant state, maybe not necessarily tied to PCOS but it certainly can turn on that switch for Hashimoto's. So we are seeing, again, we don't know why, I, could, I wish I could give you all the answers, we don't exactly know why there's a strong correlation between autoimmunity, so Hashimoto's and PCOS, but there is. So women with PCOS, you're more prone to, to have Hashi. You better get those antibody levels checked because Hashimoto's could be hanging out for decades, decades before it goes, before it gets diagnosed. So Hashimoto's can go decades before getting diagnosed. Those antibodies can be present with the TPO and TJ antibodies. A lot of times we see a false negative. You have to test over and over again. And there are five stages to Hashimoto. So you could be in the beginning stages where there's just a few antibodies and maybe they're not even being detected. And then you move into the latter stages where you are actually starting to get other, get symptoms. And you're saying, you're one of the people that are saying, hey, listen, doc, um, I'm gaining weight here and I'm tired all the time and my hair is falling out and I'm depressed. Please don't slap an antidepressant on me. <laughs> Can we actually like figure out what's going on? And you get the TSH and maybe the free T4 and you go undiagnosed for decades until you meet a functional medicine practitioner who cares about you and then test everything. And then we find out, hey, you have Hoshi Meadows. I can't tell you the amount of times I've asked this question to a patient. Um, have you ever been told that you have Hashimoto's? They go, no. I'm like, well, <laughs> guess what? And we see it on the forums as well. Just, I think just last week on the anterior thyroid, there was a question. Someone posted their blood work. It's like, um, that's Hashimoto's because your antibodies are high. And I know that's the first time that you've had them tested, but... And I think their doctor didn't tell them that they had Hashi or something like that. They said everything was fine. Ah, I'm going down a rabbit hole, aren't I? So let's get back to the treatments of Pico. Since we're talking about Band-Aids, right? Let's get back to the common treatments of Pico. So you're diagnosed with Picos. And then you get offered birth control. That is a Band-Aid. That is a synthetic Band-Aid. So not only that, but just the 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 hormones alone in birth control can really throw off your thyroid. So if you're PCOS, but not hypo yet, and they throw you on some birth control, now you're increasing your chances. So you already started off over here at PCOS. You already started off with an increased risk of having an autoimmune condition, specifically Hashimoto. So we know that there's that tie. And now guess what? Now we're going to throw some, some synthetic hormones on you in the form of birth control. Now you're at even a greater risk. Now we're just, we're just amping up. We're just amping it up. We're increasing your risk of hypothyroidism. And if I was a betting woman, I would bet money that two years, one year after starting the birth control, you're going to be diagnosed Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism if all of your labs are done properly. If, 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 if. Or you might just go decades like many people do and not be diagnosed and you'll just suffer with symptoms for decades until you meet a functional medicine practitioner who does all the testing and cares about you. So that would be the first line. So there's birth control. Um, there's Spiro. Spiro. I can never say that. There are certain words 
that you guys know, I can't say spirulonolactone, spiral, let's just call it Spiro. Okay. So it is a diuretic weak at best. Um, sometimes it can actually interfere with hormones. It's meant to kind of have that anti-androgen effect, but it doesn't really always work. Some people will get an alleviation of their acne from it. Some won't. So Spiro, birth control, and then there's metformin. I have no problems with metformin. When it's used properly and it's really necessary, then let's do it. I mean, you have heard me talk about berberine. So there's medical studies out that show that berberine and metformin work well together. Berberine can work on its own. You can switch from metformin to berberine. There are pros and cons with, with metformin. Some people can't tolerate it. It will cause loose stools. It'll cause diarrhea. There's been some studies out correlating it to increase cancer risk. Then there's been studies out correlating it to decrease cancer risk because when you decrease your insulin, you're decreasing your cancer risk. Oh, we have to sort through these studies. We have to sort through them, look for the bias, look for the, the people that are funding the studies. That's for another talk. That's another day. Um, so you have metformin, you have birth control, you have Spiro. Those are the common Band-Aids. I am telling you, if you decrease your insulin levels, your periods will become more regular and you will become fertile. I have had patients get pregnant in two to three months after balancing out their insulin, lowering that insulin, that high insulin that is correlated to hypo, that is correlated to Hashi, that is definitely correlated to PCOS. You lower that insulin, all of a sudden, fertile. So that's one thing you have to be careful of if you don't want to get pregnant when we lower your insulin levels and don't walk around with high insulin levels because you don't want to get pregnant. That's not the answer. But just be careful because you might be more fertile whether you want to or not. So infertility, big one with PCOS and hypo, you have to balance both. You got to balance both. So we can use metformin, we can use berberine, but sometimes that alone is all that is needed to get a response and get some movement and get some healing from picos. Now, sometimes, like I said, we will use Vitex Chase Berry. So if your progesterone is low and you're young and you're suffering from acne, Vitex Chase Berry is great to add in. If you are estrogen dominant, we can use Indole-3-Carbinol and DIM. That will pull down the bad estrogen. So that's a nice kind of combination. Designs for Health has a FemGuard plus balance. So that has DIM and Indole-3 and Vitex in it. Really, really nice when patients are having heavy periods, painful periods, long periods, hot flashes. And then if they are experiencing hormonal acne, that can work really well as well. So there are natural routes that we can go for PCOS, 100% berberine with the insulin resistance. That's a nice natural combination that just works so well together. I can't even tell you, it's just beautiful. And then over here, we do the thyroid. So we do that thyroid connection, right? We do the, the thyroid connecting to the PCOS, Let's optimize this over here because we can't just do one thing. We have to do both. So then on the thyroid side, you know, it's about optimizing you. It's about finding what your levels are, comparing that with your symptoms. It's about getting you into the optimal zone. It's about getting you on the right medication too. So many of you are stuck on T4 only. I'm not a fan. I am not a fan, period. So you will hear me talk about being on T3 only. That's me. I have a handful of patients that are as well. If you've ever heard one of my favorite people that I think were like soul sisters somewhere in a different universe, uh, L. Russ. So I totally want to talk to L. Russ. L, if you're listening, I want to be on your podcast and I want you to be on my podcast. We talk the same. We're just blunt. We're real. She's on T3 only as well. I'm telling you, we're soul sisters. So there are many, even hypothyroidism, thyroid advocates out there that are on T3 only. Sometimes that's for you. Sometimes it's not. But getting, the most important thing is just getting on the right medication and the right dose. And sometimes that really takes working with someone. So not, not next week, but the week after. So December 7th, I'm bringing on for a guest, my patient that has had tremendous success She's down 20 pounds. And you know, when we go back and I'll let you tell her, tell you her history. When we go back, she was wrongly medicated. She was under medicated. She was one of those that, yeah, they gave her armor, but it wasn't quite right. Yeah. They gave her Cytomel. They gave her leothyronine, but they stopped it at five or 10 micrograms, really low dose. I want to say five. And that's where she was stuck. 
And she went deeper, deeper, deeper into a hypo state. And all they were doing was increasing her T4, increasing her T4, never checking reverse D3. She was in such a deep hypo state with insulin resistance that she kept gaining and gaining and gaining. And now she's down 20 pounds. Her face is slimmer. You can see that, that moon face that we all get when we're deeply hypo. I had it too. I told her I have to find that picture of me from 20 some years ago with the moon face. Um, it's not fat per se. Thyroid patients that are under medicated, mismedicated, not diagnosed, misdiagnosed, have that poofy face. And that's one of the first things that we see go down when we put you on the proper medication at the right dose. I had one patient that we started on T3 and she had the poofy eyes. Like she got it like right under her eyes. And within two days, no, it might've been the first day. It might've been the first day that she was on it. Her husband said, hon, you got to go look in the mirror. And her face was totally like the dark circles were almost gone. The poofiness under her eye, she could see her eyes again, open her eyes up. So sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it's immediate. But a lot of times we see that, that effect on the face. So a lot of it comes back to with PCOS, finding that right combination, sometimes medication if we're using metformin. Some, hey, sometimes we even, even something like, um, what am I thinking? Accutane. So when someone presents with really bad cystic acne and you know how bad, I mean, you know, you do know how bad it is as a woman or a man to be walking around with acne that won't go away. And here we are fixing your thyroid and we're lowering your insulin and we're balancing your hormones and you still have it. Sometimes we do a round of Accutane. If, if all the blood work and we check your liver enzymes, all that is good. Sometimes that one round will knock that acne right out. Some people don't want to go that harsh. Some people don't want to go that route and roll that dice with the side effects. So that's fine. We do it the natural way. We use the Vitex. We use the DIM. We use the Indol 3. We use the Femgar Plus Balance by Designs for Health. Sometimes we use Metformin. We use the Berberine. And then we give it time. And over here, we're, we're optimizing your thyroid too. So it's that combination of doing everything together that really gives relief from both PCOS and Hypo. But make no doubt about it. There is a correlation. There's a correlation with Hypo there's a correlation with Hashi and PCOS. So if you are, so my, my leaving statement to you would be, if you are suffering, if you've already been diagnosed with hypo, right? Maybe you're like me, maybe you're like my story. You've already been diagnosed with hypo. You're on meds, you know, we kind of got you going, okay. And then all of a sudden you're getting hit with symptoms and we're checking your thyroid and everything seems fine. And your doc is checking the TSH and the free T3 and free T4 and reverse T3. And we're checking the antibodies, make sure those didn't go up. And we're checking, checking, checking. It's like, you know what? But, but why? Why do I still feel this way? Why am I still gaining weight? Why am I breaking out? Why are my periods irregular? Why can't I get pregnant? I thought we had my thyroid optimized. We need to check further. We need to check that insulin, glucose, A1C, free and total testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, progesterone, estradiol, FSH, LH, sex hormone binding globulin. And I might be missing one, but I think that's about a roundabout generalized list of tests that I would tell you to get. So we can check for PCOS over here because you might be having some of that and you don't even know it. So we need to diagnose that and treat that properly as well. And of course, if you have any more questions, hang on people that have questions, hang on. But if you have any more questions for me, please feel free to visit my website, you can book a call. So we are booking free discovery calls where you can, first of all, you can go to the website, watch a video, learn more about how I work one on one with patients, you can book a call, we can chat, we can talk about you what's going on, and you can find out how I can help you. So as always, please share this because do you know the amount of women that suffer with PCOS? Do you have any idea? It's, I just told you, it's the top PCOS and hypothyroidism, top two endocrine disorders. That means a lot of your female friends are needlessly suffering and you have to help them. You have to give them information and you have to help them based on what you've been through. You know, we do go through things in order to help other people. I truly believe that, I believe that in my heart. So use this information, share it, and help your fellow female friend who is suffering, especially if they are struggling with infertility. So many women spend so much money going to doctors, 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 
um, IVF. I think I'm saying that right. In vitro. Yeah. And we never check their thyroid levels thoroughly. We never check their insulin. Let's check those things because that can make all the difference in the world. So, okay. Share this, please. Thank you. And if you would, if you're listening to my, my podcast is on all major platforms. So we're talking iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. What else? Amazon. So listen to it. And if there's a place to write a re review, write a review, please. And please share this. And thank you for listening. All right, let's get to your questions. I know there's a lot in here. So, okay, Miss Elaine. Hello. So nice to see you back, Dr. Amy. Hope you are doing well. Thank you, Elaine. Yes, I was gone for a couple of weeks. Thank you all for your patience and your your care and your concern and your texts. And I love it and your comments. And thank you for understanding. It's been a rough couple of weeks. Um, many of you know my mom passed, but we're doing okay. We're doing good. Um, she is in a much better place. She is with the Lord now. She is not suffering. So that's where we're at. Any of you who have lost a parent, you know, it's, it's like a rough, weird, different road. It's up and down and I'm helping my dad get used to it. And so it just, you know, there might be some times that I cry in front of you guys and you know, that's okay. Cause I'm human. So thank you for checking in and asking, um, Miss Jesse. So I have Picos. Mine was found from blood. So your labs. Yep. Even though when I had an ultrasound, no cyst, right? So Jesse, we said this in the beginning, I think you were on, yeah, you were on right in the beginning. We're ch kind of changing the diagnostic criteria with Picos. Now you don't have to have cysts to have Picos. I want to say it's about, is it like 20? I heard the, the stat or I read the stat earlier. I'm going to say it's like 20% of women diagnosed with Picos actually don't have the ovarian cysts. So hi, Miss Donna. Um, Elaine, you're saying for sure there is a correlation. Have been done undiagnosed hypo for decades, but once on thyroid medication, there wasn't a major shift in how I was feeling until I had sex hormone panels done. Now finally on progesterone, um, HRT, and the difference is night and day. Yeah. And especially, Elaine, I forget how old you are, but like I was saying, with the younger population, we can use Vitex, we can use um, Vitex Ch Chaseberry Agnes Castus for progesterone balancing. We can use uh, Progesta Veil from Designs for Health. That's a serum. So we can like microdose the serum, like half a milliliter, quarter milliliter. But then in, in women, 40s, 50s, where we're in like perimenopause, menopause, almost menopause, um, we can use progesterone, actually hormone replacement therapy, where it's warranted to really get those numbers up because you don't want to be walking around with low progesterone. As you know, Elaine, low progesterone, you will be irritable. So low progesterone, it's, it's one of those where like your friends or your significant other will say, well, why are you so bitchy? So that is low progesterone and you won't sleep and you'll be big and poofy and hold water like crazy. So I'm glad you noticed the difference, Elaine. Um, Sandra, what if you were getting more acne with thyroid meds? So it's not, there's not, Sandra, there's not always a correlation. It's not necessarily the thyroid meds causing the acne, but I will say this, if you were intolerant, so if you're using, let's say Levo, so generic T4, maybe that's not jiving with you. You might have to go to brand. You might have to go to Tyrosin. It could be the fillers in there that are throwing things off. It could be that you're still under medicated or that your thyroid is not optimized and that's causing the hormonal imbalance, which would then cause the acne. And make sure you test your dihydrotestosterone, your free and total, your progesterone, your estradiol, get all those, and DHEA, get all those hormone panels done so that you can see, is there something that's that's kind of driving acne? I mean, even, you know, you pushing, pushing up your estrogen from environmental toxins, is your testosterone abnormally high and you're not even like using a testosterone cream? Does your boyfriend or husband use testosterone? Because we, I just had this conversation with my nurse practitioner the other day. Um, women who are with a man who uses testosterone therapy, be it in the form of cream or injectables, through sexual relations can actually see an increase in their own testosterone levels. Yeah, especially if the guy's using high amounts. Now, if you're using it for hormone replacement and you're he's using like, you know, um, like a lower dose of like 200 milligrams a week, 400 milligrams a week, that's still kind of low. But the guys are using like six, seven, eight, a thousand a week, that's going to bump them up. That's going to bump up their normal testosterone levels pretty high and it can transfer to 
their partner. So just kind of be aware of that too, Sandra. Not saying that's your case. Just saying be aware of it. Um, Elaine, berberine, berberine, berberine. I know it's my favorite. So Michelle, is berberine more effective than metformin? So Michelle, it's as effective. The medical literature shows that berberine is as effective as metformin. And I do have a podcast. We'll link to it in the show notes so you can click on that. It was We just released it last week about me talking all about berberine. It's a nice short one so you can listen to it and kind of bone up on it. Um, I give my story of how I switched from metformin to berberine. And it was kind of like my test that I did years ago before I would recommend it to patients. I did that test to see, okay, if I'm switching and this isn't a one-to-one -one ratio, I'm gaining weight. So I switched from metformin to berberine, super easy. I use it on my patients with, so with really bad type two diabetes, like if your A1C is above a six and you're on metformin, I'm probably going to use berberine and metformin together with you. But if your A1C is below a six and you're just struggling with weight and your insulin's, you know, hanging out at like a, an eight or a 10, something like that, then we can use berberine only and it's going to work just like metformin to lower your insulin, your blood glucose. I have seen it go down in patients. It's actually amazing when they start tracking, when patients start tracking their blood glucose levels. It's amazing how that drops. Um, Emma, high normal iron with low, low normal ferritin. Okay, so high normal iron with low normal ferritin. Okay. My iron was a 50 before supplementation with ferritin at 24. But after three months of supplementation, iron was 129 and ferritin was 34. The ferritin is the storage form. It takes a while to come up. And the most important thing, Emma, for you to be doing is taking your iron supplement with vitamin C. Um, you want to make sure if you're on thyroid meds that you take it four hours away. And then sometimes it's just the type of iron. I mean, I've seen patients just switch over, like they'll switch over to ferritol iron, um, which is really easy on the gut. So we can go up in the dose of ferritol without it causing that constipation and that horrific gut slamming that iron will do. Um, so we can go up in the ferritol iron by Designs for Health, and, and that's going to raise the ferritin. Pair that with vitamin C, definitely improves absorption. Now there are, and there are some people that need iron infusions. Um, I haven't seen it quite often in my patient population, but I would say like two in the last year uh, needed to do iron infusions IV because their iron just wasn't, it was so sluggish and coming up. Now your total iron has come up significantly. So um, 24 to 34 in three months, that's a little bit slow. That's a little bit slow. I would say it's the type that you're using. And if you're not pairing with, with C and it might be, you know, just the brand. Um, so that's, so I answered your second question. Why, why ferritin barely increases? So, um, okay. Do I get blood drawn and start over? And I would, I would just, I would switch your brands. I'll, I'll make sure I put a link, um, to the ferritol iron too. So actually let me, Emma, let me do, Really quick, I'm going to put in here one. This is the link to Designs for Health. And you can go on there and look up um, Ferrochel Iron. So that's what you want to take. And that's what you can increase. So I would say, like, start with your starting labs right now. Take the Ferrochel, maybe two, three per day with vitamin C. You might even have to, like, double dose it so you're not taking too much at one time. And then see where that ferritin goes after that. Okay, Pete. So wait, wait, wait. Let me go back. Sandra, I have Hashimoto. Should I not take birth control? Well, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take it because I can't tell you that. That's up to you and your doctor because um, you're not my patient. But I would say, are you, I would ask you, are you getting side effects from the birth control? Like, are you gaining weight? Did you gain weight when you started it? I mean, it, it, it's synthetic hormones. So, you know, it kind of comes down to, too, listen, if I'm meeting with a patient, I'm like, are you young and you don't want to, do you not want to get pregnant? It doesn't matter what age you are. Do you not want to get pregnant? Are you using birth control because you don't want to have a baby? Then who's me to say, don't use birth control? I can only tell you the pros and the cons, but I mean... If you don't want to get pregnant and you do, that's kind of a con. So I think you might have to ride out the cons of the birth control to avoid pregnancy. Um, 
You know, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. It, it just kind of depends on you as a person. So that's, I mean, that's kind of something I discuss with my patients one-on-one -on -one based on their, their side effects, their symptoms, whether we can get any change, why they're taking it, you know, were they given the birth control as a band-aid or are they taking it for the avoidance of pregnancy? So it kind of makes a difference there. Um, Kristen, Picos and Graves, hypothyroidism on Spiro is birth control. So Graves is hyper. So are you, are you Kristen, are you Hashi? And on Spiro is birth control better? Haven't had a period in three years. No. What would be better is that we optimize your thyroid and we use all of the things that I talked about to treat the PICO. So I would use berberine with you. I would check your hormone levels and then we would adjust your hormone levels. The Spiro, it just it doesn't do that much. I wouldn't, I wouldn't totally rely on the Spiro. I would use the things like DIM and Indol3 and Vitex Chaseberry and FemGuard. So that link that I just posted, you can look up the FemGuard plus balance too. And um, that... That would be better. And then I need to know whether you're Graves or Hashi because, or are you swinging between Graves and Hashi, meaning you're, you're hyper and then you're swinging back to hypo, which is very, very common. So you can be diagnosed with Graves and then swing over to Hashi. I have a patient right now that just swung to the other side. So now we're treating him with, uh, um, with armor because now he's all over here in the Hashi category, in the Hashi hypothyroid category. So, do I also think heavy metals are related to picos and hypo? Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. So heavy metals alone can cause hypothyroidism. So when we're talking about, you know, hypothyroidism is a problem with the thyroid gland. Yeah, absolutely. Heavy metals alone. And there are various heavy metal tests. There are different heavy metal um, detox protocols that you really want to do with a practitioner because detoxing heavy metals is long and it needs to be done correctly so that you bind to the heavy metals and actually excrete them out of your body instead of have them recirculate. Miss Jess, I always see you on here. Thank you. Thanks for jumping on. Um, wait, I just lost your... I just lost your question. This video is giving me hope for getting pregnant someday. Lots of what you're describing sounds like what I've been going through the last one plus decades. So yeah, um, I, I, I promise you, listen, I've, I've made the joke, like I've gotten a couple of patients pregnant, ha ha, meaning I balanced their insulin and we optimized their thyroid and they got pregnant. So it's absolutely possible. Trust me, trust me, please have hope. Please have hope because it's about balancing the thyroid, lowering that insulin, balancing your hormones. That's it. It's that simple. It's that simple. Now, of course, are there genetic factors? Sure. Um, you know, short cervix, genetic factors, trouble with the man's sperm, all of that comes into play. Yes, I know. That's what the fertility docs are for to check. But sometimes they miss the forest of the trees. Is that the right? Forest through the trees, forest for the trees, forest in the trees, the trees in the forest. Sometimes it's just that. Look at the simple things. Look at the look at what's right in front of you instead of looking at like all these complex factors that it could be. Look at the simple things. Um, Elaine, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, Elaine. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Shiny. I love you, Elaine. <laughs> I just love you. Um, what is the name of your podcast? Yeah, that's important. So the name of my podcast is the Thyroid Fix Podcast. And you can find it on, like I said, all the different platforms. So if you would be so kind to subscribe. And you know the reason why I like podcasts? Listen, I love being here with you guys on Facebook Lives. I love it. I love it. But I personally love listening to podcasts because you just play it. And then you don't have to watch a video. And then you can actually, like, if you're listening to the podcast and somebody texts you, you can, you can still play the podcast and go back and text and then listen to the podcast some more. I listen to podcasts in the car, in the shower, while I'm getting ready. I'll put my headphones in so I can still blow dry my hair and listen to a podcast at the same time. I mean, just filled with good information. And then you can just go one after the other. Boom, boom, boom. You don't have to scroll through videos. Okay, when's the next one? So you can just go right through. So it's the Thyroid Fix Podcast with Amy Horneman. And you can find it on all podcast platforms. So thank you for asking. Kristen, Synthroid 125. They want to give me estradiol one milligram and medroxyprogesterone five milligrams. Can I just take the estradiol, not progesterone? I take Spiro for acne and facial hair. Can I take birth control instead or something else? Miss Kristen, we need to work with you. <laughs> you need to schedule a call so we can fix you. First of all, 
you're on T4 only. I'm not a fan. It doesn't work. They're going to keep bumping up that T4, or that Synthroid. And have you had your reverse T3 checked? What is your free T3? Because that could be the main problem right there. No, you don't want to take estradiol without progesterone. If your progesterone is low and you just take the estradiol, you're going into an estrogen dominant state. Then you have a huge problem with that estrogen dominance interfering with T4 to T3 conversion. You're only on T4. You need that T4 to convert over to T3, not to reverse T3. And estrogen can get in the way. So do not walk around with high estrogen. It's going to exacerbate your hypothyroid symptoms. And it could actually make it worse because then you're going to have too much reverse T3. Um, I would not take birth control instead. The acne and facial hair is most likely from high insulin, high testosterone, high DHT. So we test all of your hormone levels and balance it out that way. Sometimes we will use a progesterone cream. Not to say that you can't use the estradiol too, but I wouldn't rely on birth control because you can't, with the birth control, you can't fix the um, the balance, right? So just like T4 and T3, it's not that I'm not a fan of, of NDTs, but it's an 80-20 balance. So sometimes when someone's on natural desiccated thyroid, we'll add in T3 to change that ratio. Same thing with birth control. If you're on birth control, you're stuck in that ratio, whatever that ratio is of estrogen to progesterone. I hope that answers your question. Prayers for you and your family. Thank you, Ms. Kristen. Now, please feel free to go to my website. Um, I will put it here. It's just my name. It's amyhorneman.com. And you can click on book a call. And then that way we can jump on a discovery call. It'll be either me or my assistant, uh, Karen. She's right-hand woman. She knows what I do, how I do. She's a former patient of mine. So you can jump on a call and we can kind of learn more about what you're going through beyond what you posted here and then talk about getting you all straightened out. So even when it comes to hormones, when it comes to thyroid, so it used to be that I couldn't prescribe. I can now prescribe. I have a nurse practitioner on my team. She's great with thyroid. She's great with hormones. She's an out-of-the-box thinker. She believes in T3 only. Um, she's a pro at balancing hormones too. We just work really well together. So we have you covered on all fronts there if you need prescriptions. So we have you covered there. And then we'll go into, Kristen, we'll go into everything else um, that we do too together, nutrition and supplements and lifestyle and stress and the whole deal. Detox pathways, all of that. Miss Sandra, you are on Tyrosin. So that's the purest form. So maybe it's not that. I think it maybe might come back around to, like I said earlier, just kind of balancing you out, like balancing out the, the hormones and balancing out, you know, the figuring out what's actually causing your acne, balancing out your, well, optimizing your thyroid and then balancing the hormones. Like actually, let's look at your DHT. Let's look at your testosterone, let's look at your progesterone, all of that, instead of just slapping on a birth control and calling it a day. I mean, estrogen can convert to DHT too, that hydrotestosterone. That's why man's, men get man boobs when they take steroids. So if you look at a bodybuilder, I mean, listen, I'm all for taking supplementing with testosterone because too many men are walking around with low T, way too many. But most of the time, the, the low testosterone is caused by high estrogen or it's caused by they're taking testosterone and it's pushing to bad estrogen and dihydrotestosterone. That's why they get the like male pattern baldness, too much DHT and look at acne too. So going, Sandra, circling this around to you, we need to, we need to optimize your thyroid and we need to make sure that we're not pushing up your estrogen because that's not necessarily a fix. Hopefully you understand that. Um, so Sandra, you too, go to my website, schedule a call because we need to get you strained out. Quit, I, I implore all of you, do not start throwing darts and crossing your fingers and wishing on a rainbow that what you're doing is going to work. Do it all at once. Work with somebody that can sit down and look at your labs and explain everything that's going on and get a treatment protocol, even if it is medication. Sometimes we do it naturally. Sometimes we use meds. Even if it is going that route, do it so it's done right and that you're not playing a guessing game. And then suffering for another six months to a year until you finally, you know, take that leap to actually take care of yourself the right way. Quit guessing. Don't guess. Test. Don't guess. Um, Elaine, over 50. <laughs> so I will say I'm oldish. You're not oldish yet. 50 is the new 30. You know that. Um, Ollie, I'm taking Levo. What is the blood work test call for PCOS? My weight fluctuates all the time. And I still have moon phase, Betty boot, Betty boot phase. That's a good one. Very stressful. Um, so 
Ali, I just posted a picture with a testimonial right before I came on here. So it was the last post before the live that you will see my patient. We were just talking moon faces yesterday. So her testimonial and a before and after pic. So I urge you to look at that. Um, and it really is about, I'm not a T4 only fan. The test that you have to get for PCOS, again, the full thyroid panel. So we have to test TSH, free T4, free T3, reverse T3 thyroid antibodies. And then with PCOS, we have to do all of your hormones. So all of them, all of them. And then we can really end insulin and A1C and a CMP and leptin. So that gives us that whole picture of what's actually going on with your metabolism. When your weight's fluctuating, you still have that poofy, that myxedema, that, that poofy moon face. And myxedema can also be found on your like any part of your skin that is thick. So it's like you'll grab, I, I know I just grabbed my arm. So normally it's like the arm, like the tricep area, you'll grab and it's like, it's not that, it's just like thick skin. So that's another symptom of hypothyroidism. Ollie, I don't know if you suffer from that as well, but that kind of points more in the direction that we need to optimize your thyroid. Um, Emma, if I take more iron, it will go above 160, which is above reference range. Right, it's hard, it's hard for me to... I cannot tell you what to do. You're not my patient. So I have to say that, that these are just suggestions to maybe bring up to the practitioner that you are working with, because maybe it is a matter of the type of iron that you're using rather than the dose. So I don't know what you're using. I don't know what dose it is. Um, are you taking it with vitamin C? All of the, all of those factors play a role. And then just even adding it into your diet too, like spinach and red meat and all that good stuff. But yeah, I'm not necessarily telling you to, to push your level, but we don't want the, the iron to go too high, but we want your ferritin to come up a little bit, especially as it relates to thyroid and hair. Um, yeah. Doc said too much iron is toxic and to stop it. Then Emma, absolutely go by what your doctor says um, because he, she is, they're guiding you. So you kind of have to go by that, but just keep it and maybe have that conversation like, hey, doc, you think it's the type? Like maybe I try a different brand, something like that to get the ferritin up. Um, Sandra, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Kristen, you had your thyroid removed at 12. Okay, so even more important even more important. So you thought you were Gray's hypo. So Gray's is hyper and Hashi is hypo. And if you had your thyroid removed, I always say, uh, you cannot remove someone's thyroid and then replace with T4 only because the thyroid, when it was there, used to make T4 and T3. So here we are, we're taking your thyroid out and we're just giving you T4 and saying, okay, now convert this. Good luck. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of times it doesn't. That's probably why you're still suffering with symptoms. I work with um, thyroidectomy patients all the time, partial and total, all the time, all the time. And it really is about optimizing those levels. Jennifer, love this. Waiting on my labs to come back to see you first week in December. Yay. Thanks for these talks. Gives me faith that maybe I'll get things straightened out. No, not maybe, not maybe. You will, absolutely, we will, we will. I promise you that. So, uh, no, it, it's, it's easy for me. This is easy for me. I mean, every once in a while, I get a challenging patient. That's kind of fun, but this is easy for me to do. It's about optimizing you. It's about doing what I've done with patients for 24 years. So I can promise you, and Hey, you know, Kristen and Sandra and Emma, Jennifer will tell you once we start working together and you can obviously, you can go, go read the testimonial that I just posted. I just posted it on my page. So read it. It's the post right before this live. And I put a picture up because my patient let me put her picture up her before and after. And I have some more before and afters of her as well. She is just beyond thrilled beyond. I and mean, we still have some weight that she wants to lose, but 20 pounds, 20 pounds in three months. And, and she suffered for decades and decades. I'm actually using her to write a paper, to write a paper that I'm going to publish on the importance of T3 medication and, and the difference that it makes because it makes a huge difference. Here's a patient that suffered, suffered, suffered decades, decades, decades. Given T3 too low of a dose, they didn't give it the credit that, that it's due. They did not give the T3 the credit that it's due, so they didn't raise her. And she was stuck, just stuck in that hypo state. So it, it really is about um, optimizing people. And that's what we're going to do with you, Jennifer. So that's not a problem. And Kristen, last question. Thank you. Um, so we can, 
call for a phone call with lab work we have and then do other labs with you. So wait, let me, so Kristen, so the first phone call, the discovery call, let me try to get you that. Um, I'm going to get you that link directly and I'll put it in here. So Kristen, the discovery call is first for just me to figure out about you. Um, tell me what's going on. I know you, you, you know, you said a little bit here, you probably have to remind me. Um, like I said, it'll be either myself or Karen. And then we're going to learn more about you, go over how I work with patients one-on-one, -on -one, everything that you get, because you get a lot when you work with me. Um, so you get a lot, you get a lot of personalization. You get me 24 seven access. You get a personal phone number that you can reach out to me and ask me any questions. So you always have that support and accountability. You get a personalized nutrition plan. We go over your supplements. You get the treatment protocol. We can do prescriptions if needed. And we'll go over all of that with you. And then at the time of your initial consultation, so if you're like, yes, I want to get fixed, please. Then we schedule you. I'll call you to schedule you. We'll pick a day and time that works for you. Put you in. 90 minutes is the first one. 90 minutes is the first consultation. We go through a lot. We go through all your symptoms. We're going At that time, we're going through your labs because I want to see what labs you have now. I know you're waiting on some, but then I want to see all the other labs that maybe they did over the course of a year or two. And that kind of gives me, because sometimes they would have done something six months ago that they didn't do this round of labs, but that still gives me input. So I can piece that whole picture together. So that's really what it's about. So I urge you to um, book a call, Kristen, Sandra, definitely, Miss Emma, definitely. Because uh, Emma, I can't do much with your, I still, I Emma, I tell you, talk to your doctor. I can't do much with, recommendations with that because you got to talk to your doctor. But um, yeah, let's chat. Let's get you on the books. Let's get you straight down. Just get your life back like now instead of next year. Okay. So I will see you this week with more videos. Please subscribe to the Thyroid Fix podcast. Tons of information there. Tons of info. And I will see you back here next week, next Monday at 4 p.m. Glad to be back, you guys. Thank you for coming.